Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're going to be doing something a little bit different and delving into some industrial archaeology. So a couple of years ago, I was in London, the cool one, not the Ontario one, and engaged in a bit of mudlarking, that is, combing the banks of the River Thames to see what has washed up. And typically what you'll find are fragments of ceramics, usually from the Victorian period, but if you're very lucky, dating all the way back to the Roman period. And you'll also find tons of these. These are fragments of clay tobacco pipes. And for 300 years, clay pipes were really the cigarettes of their day. They were a mass-produced, extremely cheap, and ultimately disposable form of tobacco consumption. And these are very often found at archaeological sites and are actually used by archaeologists to date those sites with a great deal of precision. And that is what we are going to be looking at today. Now, the manufacture of clay pipes began in the late 16th century, very shortly after the introduction of tobacco to Europe from the New World. And while the habit very quickly caught on, it was roundly condemned by the authorities, such as the church, or in the British Isles specifically, by King James I, who in 1602 published a treatise titled A Counterblast to Tobacco and raised the import tax by 4,000%. Now, when Sir Walter Raleigh, who was instrumental in introducing tobacco to England, was executed for treason in 1618, English pipe makers responded by molding his effigy into their pipes. And this enraged King James, who responded in 1620 by forming a pipe makers guild and making any pipe making activity outside of the guild illegal. This in turn prompted a mass exodus of pipe makers from England to the Netherlands, specifically in the region of Gouda, the same as the cheese. And this would be a major center for clay pipe production in Europe for hundreds of years to come. Now, of course, attitudes towards tobacco smoking would eventually relax and the production of clay pipes exploded, reaching its peak around 1680 to 1700. And during this period, pretty much every small town in the British Isles had at least one pipe maker, and there were more than a thousand pipe makers in London alone. And the main reason that clay pipes were so popular was that they were much cheaper to produce than pipes made of other materials, such as briar or meerschaum. And by the way, if you've ever wondered what those materials are, briar is made from the burl or swelling of the root of the tree heath, or Erica arborea. And this is a very dense and fire-resistant wood, which makes it ideal for making the bowls of pipes. Meerschaum, on the other hand, is a soft white magnesium-based clay more properly known as sepiolite, and this is also very heat-resistant and very easy to carve into intricate shapes. And since you know I love my etymology, Meerschaum comes from German and it means sea foam, whereas sepiolite comes from sepion, which is Greek for cuddle bone. This is the rigid pen inside the body of a cuttlefish whose texture resembles that of Meerschaum. So now you know. And another reason why clay pipes were so popular was that they didn't impart any extra flavor onto the tobacco smoke. And indeed, even today, tobacco blenders will use clay pipes to taste and compare different blends. Now, there are a number of different techniques for producing clay pipes. One was to roll a long, thin cylinder for the stem and a shorter, fatter cylinder for the bowl, and then press these into a mold, which would have any decoration or maker's marks or other features carved into it. You would then hollow out the bowl with a reamer, push a wire through the stem to create the bore before opening the mold and firing the pipe in a kiln. The second method was called slip casting, and this involved the use of slip or liquefied clay. And so you would pour this into a ceramic mold, and since the mold was porous, it would pull some of the water away from the clay, leading to the formation of a harder layer along the inside of the mold. You would then pour out the excess slip, poke a wire through the stem to create the bore, and then open the mold and fire the pipe. Now, the design and finish of these pipes varied widely. Some were very elaborately decorated, while some were very plain. Some were burnished to a glossy finish, while others were left matte. And the length of the stems also varied a great deal. The shorter versions were called cutties or nose warmers, and these were popular among the working classes because they could be very easily held between your teeth, leaving your hands free to perform manual labor. The ones with the rarely long stems, on the other hand, were known as church wardens, and these were popular among the upper classes because the long stem cooled the tobacco smoke and made for a more pleasant smoking experience. 
But ultimately, like I said at the beginning, these pipes were considered disposable, like cigarettes. If the stem broke, which it often did, you could just throw away the pipe and get another. And indeed, as you smoke these pipes, the bore would become increasingly clogged with tar. And so all you did was you snapped off that section of the stem, threw it away, and continued smoking. And you continued to do this until the stem became too short to use, and then you'd throw it away. Now, at this time, taverns often kept a supply of communal clay pipes that could be shared among different customers. And while it has been claimed that once one customer was finished with such a pipe, the innkeeper would just snap off the end of the stem and pass it on to the next person, there's actually no evidence that this actually happened. Rather, the standard procedure was to take these pipes and place them on a special rack on the stove to cleanse them and clean them for the next customer. And while these pipes were considered largely disposable, some effort was made to prolong their life, and an entire pipe cleaning industry grew up alongside the pipe making industry. And so if you had a couple of clay pipes that needed cleaning, you would bundle them together, give them to the cleaner, and they would put them in a kiln or on some hot coals to burn off any accumulated tar and return the clay to its white finish. Now, the clay pipe making industry went through several cycles of boom and bust over 300 years. The first was in the 1720s when the upper classes largely turned to taking snuff rather than smoking tobacco, and the second in the late 1700s when imports of tobacco from the New World were interrupted due to the American Revolution. However, tobacco imports and the production of clay pipes picked up again in the early 19th century, and clay pipes remained popular all the way into the 1930s when they were finally replaced by even cheaper mass-produced cigarettes. Now, while clay pipes are fascinating cultural artifacts in their own right, with a long and rich history, they are particularly interesting because over the 300 or so years where they were most popular, their design changed very rapidly and according to broadly predictable trends. This means that it is relatively easy to determine the age of a particular clay pipe fragment by its design, and by extension to determine the age of any other artifacts found in the same area. Now, of course, these trends are very broad and general. You have to remember that these pipes were produced by thousands of artisans scattered across large areas of Europe and North America at a time when communication was nowhere near as efficient as it is today, meaning that there will always be regional exceptions and variations. But by and large, you can typically use clay pipes to date a site within around a decade, or if you're really lucky, within just a couple of years. Now, there are a large number of indicators that you can use to determine the age of a pipe. For example, the size, shape, and angle of the bowl, the length, taper, and inner diameter of the stem, the degree and type of decoration, the type of bowl, heel, or spur, which is used to rest the pipe on a flat surface, and most useful, the maker's mark, which is usually molded or stamped on top of the stem, the rear of the bowl, or the sides of the heel or spur. Now, in terms of general historic trends, bulls tended to become larger as tobacco prices fell, as well as squatter and more perpendicular to the stem. The stems became longer and more tapered. Decoration gave way to planar pipes. More multicolored local clays gave way to pure white clays. And stamp makers' marks gave way to molded ones. Spurs on pipe bowls were introduced in the early 17th century and remained in use along the heel bowls while heelless or spurless bowls were produced almost exclusively for the export market. Now, going over all of these variations and trends in detail would result in a very long and very boring video. After all, this is an entire sub-discipline within archaeology. So instead, why don't we use these techniques to try and figure out when these clay pipe fragments were manufactured, starting with the bowls because they will give us the greatest amount of data. Right. So if we compare our most complete bowl to Adrian Oswald's simplified general typology compiled in 1975, we can see that its shape, angle, and thickness most closely match the common southeastern type dating from around 1700 to 1770. And since I found these fragments in London, this is a good indication that they were manufactured locally. Now, while the rim of the bowl is slightly damaged, it does appear to be parallel to the stem, which is a design feature that appeared around 1700. So this gives us a potential lower cutoff date for that particular fragment. 
and the two other fragments, while far less complete, appear to be of the same general design, so we can also place them within the age bracket of 1700 to 1770. Now the next step is to look at the maker's marks, which in this case are in the form of the manufacturer's initials molded into the sides of the heel, which is a style that was common from 1580 to 1730. So this gives us a potential upper bounds on the age of these pipes. And the general convention here was that looking down the pipe as if you were smoking it, the first initial was on the left and the second initial was on the right. And also up until 1850, it was common practice to substitute the letter I for the letter J. So you'll get a lot of I's because names like John were very common in the British Isles. So looking at our first fragment, unfortunately, the initials are very worn. And the first one appears to be either a B, an E, an F, or a P while the second, while also worn, appears to be a G. Now, if you look at the second fragment, there doesn't appear at first to be a first initial. However, there is this little ridge here, which might be a worn or misplaced I, and the second initial appears to be an S. And finally, looking at the third fragment, here the initials are very well preserved and are very clearly an S and a P. Now, usefully, the British National Pipe Archive has extensive lists of pipe manufacturers from every region of the British Isles. Now, while it is possible that these fragments were produced elsewhere and imported into London, for the sake of this exercise, let's assume that they were locally produced. So looking at our list of London pipe makers for manufacturers with the initials BG, EG, FG, or PG, yields five potential results spanning the years 1696 to 1862, with only one, Bryant Green, falling close to the time period suggested by the bowl design. The initials IS or JS, meanwhile, yield a whopping 43 potential manufacturers spanning the years 1603 to 1899, with 10, John Story to John Savell, falling within the established time period. And finally, the initials SP yield four potential manufacturers spanning the years 1694 to 1856, with only two, both named Solomon Price, falling near our date range. And finally, the third step is to measure the diameter of the stem bore. And this method was developed by J.C. Harrington, who was an archaeologist for the U.S. National Park Service. And in the 1950s, he conducted a survey of thousands of clay pipe fragments discovered in Virginia and found that the diameter of the stem bore tended to go down with time and produced the following chart to help estimate the age of pipes manufactured between 1590 and 1750. Now, in 1962, another archaeologist named Louis Binford used Harrington's data to produce a linear regression formula, where you can plug in X, which is the mean bore diameter of a sample of clay pipes, and get out Y, the approximate date of manufacture. And finally, in 1972, Robert Heighton and Kathleen Deegan introduced a two-step logarithmic formula, wherein you plug in the mean bore diameter Y into the first formula to get X, then plug X into the second formula to get the date of manufacture. Now, in all cases, the bore diameter is given in 60 fourths of an inch. And so to measure these, I'm going to use a set of fine drill bits. And doing this reveals that the first and the third fragments have a bore diameter of 6 64ths of an inch, or 3 32nds, while the second has a diameter of 5 64ths, meaning that the first and the third fragments were likely made between 1680 and 1720, and the second fragment between 1720 and 1750. Using Binford's linear regression yields more specific dates of 1702 and 1740, respectively, while Heighton and Deegan's formula yield 1710 and 1743. Now, going back to our list of manufacturers, we can conclude that the first fragment was likely made by Bryant Green, we already knew this, the second by John Saltonstall, and the third by Solomon Price. And finally, measuring the bores of the two stem fragments, we can see that they are 5 64ths of an inch in diameter, meaning they were likely made between 1720 and 1750. Though without further data, there's not much else we can determine. Now, I am by no means an expert in this field. Like I said, this is an entire sub-discipline of archaeology, and it's quite possible that the dates I came up with are completely wrong. Still, I thought this would be an interesting exercise to show how the evolution of an industrial good, even one as commonplace as clay pipes, can be used to yield surprisingly accurate dates for other archaeological finds. 
Anyway, I hope you like this rather different exploration. And I'll see you next time on another video or look at yet more fascinating objects just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.